Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, CAP Guidelines for Laboratory Detection and Initial Diagnosis of Monoclonal Gammopathies. I am Kaylee Bach of LabRoots and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by Binding Sight. To learn more, please visit us.bindingsite.com. We encourage you to participate today by submitting any questions you may have during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. You may also submit any technical issues here as well if you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation. This webinar is educational and thus offers free continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education window at the bottom of your screen to obtain your credits. I'd now like to welcome our speaker, Dr. David Karen, Professor of Pathology, University of Michigan, Michigan Medicine. Dr. Karen, you may now begin your presentation. Thank you. I'm David Karen. I'd like to thank LabRoots and the Binding Site for giving me the opportunity to present the new CAP guidelines for the laboratory detection and the initial diagnosis of monoclonal gammopathies. So these are my disclosures. I do uh, work a bit with the binding site and with uh, Sabia. So I have a question for all of you. I'd like you to do some work. Who is this man and why is he not smiling? He has almost a frown on his face. Remember, you know who he is? He's important for today's talk. It's Henry Bence Jones and he's concerned. He's concerned because even today people misspell his name. So my next question for you, does Henry Benz Jones use a hyphen in his name or does he not? You can find it both ways in 2021 papers. So make your decision and I will show you his actual paper. Henry Benz Jones wrote this in 1848, it was published and uh, he uh, did not use a hyphen in his name. And he created the very first tumor marker, the Bence Jones protein, monoclonal free light chains. And we're going to be talking about them a lot today. So we owe a lot to Dr. Bence Jones. If you're still wondering about the hyphen, some of you may be, you can read this uh, interesting article by Dr. Rosenfeld in which he uh, validates that Henry Bence Jones never used a hyphen in his name, that reference books when he was uh, during his lifetime always uh, published him under Jones as do current books. The hyphen was added by his descendants, presumably members of the Bentz clan. And it was also misused by Sir William Osler in an important textbook that he wrote. And I think Dr. Osler was confusing uh, him, Bentz Jones, with a Dr. Baines Jones, who did hyphen his name. And he was a, a prominent nephrologist in London at that time. So today, uh, I hope that you are going to be able to explain why we uh, needed to produce these guidelines and uh, I hope that these will allow you to standardize M protein detection in your laboratories and also to use these features the, uh, the ratio of free light chains the M protein isotype and their concentration to identify our patients who are at the highest risks so monoclonal gammopathies are a very complex group of diseases and I like Jerry Katzman's uh, uh, discussion of them and he categorized them into three groups the neoplastic groups that we're going to be treating due to their um, plasma cell proliferation. That would be multiple myeloma is the big guy there and Waldenstrom's also, but other cases, other conditions. Then there's the low tumor burden diseases uh, where the problem is the protein that uh, deposits and that would be in uh, things like AL amyloid or neuropathy syndromes. And finally, the pre-malignant conditions, which are very common such as monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance, MGUS, or smoldering multiple myeloma. So what tools do we have in the laboratory to pick these things up? Well, electrophoresis is a big one. Uh, Gel-based techniques have been um, around for well over 100 years now, and uh, we use immunofixation to uh, characterize the M proteins that we detect. Capillary electrophoresis is a bit newer, and it uses immunosubtraction, and we're gonna be discussing that a bit today. But there's a new kit on the block, mass spectrometry, and we will spend some time on that to help characterize the M protein, not for the initial detection. And then we use nephilometry or can use uh, turbidimetry to measure total G, A, M, kappa, and lambda. 
Um, there's also a role for heavy light in many things, although not so much in the initial detection. And then there's the serum-free light chain test that we're going to spend a good deal of time on today. So why did we do this? Why are there new guidelines for CAP? It, was, it resulted from this survey that uh, John Genzen reported in uh, 2018 of 774 labs in 38 countries. At that time, two-thirds of the labs were using gel electrophoresis and one-third were using capillary. I think capillary is a bit up by now. But what were we concerned about? It was the results of what the physicians were using to detect patients with monoclonal gammopathies. The plurality, the, the largest number, came out to be laboratories that did serum protein electrophoresis only, and they would only reflex if they saw something on it. The next largest thing was the group was the labs that used serum protein electrophoresis only without automatic reflexing. And then there was the group that used serum protein electrophoresis and immunofixation, and that's all they did. Those sound good, but in fact, they're not comprehensive enough. Why is that? Well, the minority of labs were using techniques that did de detect monoclonal free light chains in some way, either through the serum free light chain test or through urine. But sadly, that only represented 30% uh, of the labs. More than 70% of them did not detect free light chains or uh, by the serum free light chain test or right, by urine immunofixation. And that's a problem because as this classic study from Dr. Uh, uh, Bob Kyle at the Mayo Clinic shows of uh, the in, uh, over a thousand cases of newly diagnosed multiple myeloma, only free light kappa and uh, lambda chains occurred in 20 percent. So that's all that was being produced. And these cases might well have been missed by those laboratories. Why is it important that we get early detection? It's because we have new therapies that work quite well today, whereas in the last part of the 20th century, the median survival was about three to five years on therapies. By 2012, as from this study uh, by McCarthy in the New England Journal of Medicine shows, the survival was almost uh, twice that. And it's even expanding faster now. Why was that? Because of new therapies, stem cell transplants, immunomodulatory agents, the use of proteasome inhibitors like bortezomib. And even since 20, 2015, the FDA has approved the use of therapeutic monoclonal antibodies that have extended this even further. We have several patients in our uh, group here at Michigan that are surviving up to 20 years or more right now. So the CAP decided to put together a, an expert panel to, uh, to look into this. And they, they included in this panel representatives from the International Myeloma Working Group, the American Association of Clinical Chemistry, the American Society for Hematology, as well as the American Society for Clinical Pathology. And the questions that we are asking in, uh, at this time were, one, what specimens are useful in detecting monoclonal proteins? What are the appropriate tests to use? And what are the appropriate tests to measure the monoclonal proteins? And we'll get into all these today. Well, if you receive Archives of Pathology, you've already seen this article. It came out a few months ago. Uh, if you haven't, you can use this link to the DOI site online, and you can get this, uh, this uh, for free. And it contains everything and many more details than I'll be able to discuss in this uh, presentation. So let me go through the statements. The first one, order both serum protein electrophoresis and serum free light chains for the initial detection of monoclonal proteins in all patients with sus suspected monoclonal gammopathies. The strength of this is uh, moderate. That talks about the uh, level of evidence that we have. From the feedback, the vast majority of individuals agreed with it. There were a few individuals that said, well, we'd like to include the serum immunofixation automatically, but what we have, but I'll show you why we don't routinely recommend doing that. And some people preferred using urine immunofixation to free light chain. And urine immunofixation is a great test, but I'll tell you why we didn't recommend that. Some of our data comes from this classic study by Dr. Katzman at the Mayo Clinic of almost 2,000 patients with monoclonal gammopathies. We like this study because it, uh, it shows in the columns, it shows the different tests that were done. SPE, serum protein electrophoresis, IFE, serum immunofixation, UIFE is urine immunofixation, and FLC is the free light chain ratio. And you see that in the different columns, uh, we are just using uh, some of those 
uh, markers to see which ones are going to be detecting. The numbers that you see in the columns are the percent of detections. So let's start out with what we're really doing. We're recommending serum uh, protein electrophoresis and the serum free light chain test. How good did it do in picking up multiple myeloma and Waldenstrom macroglobulinemia? It picked up 100% of the cases that was also picked up when you added urine immunofixation and serum immunofixation, uh, or both, both, both of those. What about uh, AL amyloid? Well, there, the, the use of all four picked up 98.1%, and the protein electrophoresis with free light chains picked up 96.2, which is actually a little better than if you just use the urine and the serum immunofixation. But we'll talk in more detail about amyloid later. What about other conditions? MGUS, monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance, was a large category. It's very common, but we missed uh, almost 12% of them. Is that a problem? It is not. In the first place, uh, monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance is not a treatable disease. There is no recommendation to screen for it. There is a study going on in Iceland right now that is trying to decide if it would be worth screening. The average individual with MGUS uh, progresses to multiple myeloma at the rate of only 1% per year. And the cases that we missed would be cases of very low risk in MGUS. Why is that? Because high risk MGUS have abnormal free light chains. And to be missed by us, you would, by definition, have a normal ratio of free light chains. Also, high risk MGUS have a relatively large amount of monoclonal gammopathy, greater than 1.5 grams per deciliter. And we would certainly have seen these by the serum protein electrophoresis. So you're, we're missing low risk people. But there is one other ish area that's important. Neuropathies, Pohm's syndrome, polyneuropathies. They are pick, picked up best by the in, serum immunofixation alone, as shown here. And so we, uh, we do recommend that patients who are being worked up for neuropathies that are associated with monoclonal gammopathies to have the additional test of immunofixation. That is a minority, minority of them, as you can see by the numbers in this table. Immunoglobulin structure is important in considering the things we're talking about. I show here an intact immunoglobulin molecule, and the letters A, B, C, D, E, and F are antigenic determinants. It's the things that we can react uh, antibodies, uh, create antibodies to, to detect immunoglobulins. But E and F are hidden in the interior of the molecule. On the right is the serum-free light chain, and you see that uh, here we have E and F are now available. Those are the epitopes, those are the antigens that Brad Bradwell and colleagues used for the initial study that developed the serum-free light chain test. This is data from Dr. Bradwell's initial report that show you several things about uh, the serum-free light chain test. It's a test on a large number of individuals with the antibodies he created. On the um, left, you have the lambda-free light chains expressed in logs. On the um, x-axis, you have the kappa light chains expressed in logs. The group of violet-colored samples toward the middle are normal serum. Patients that had kappa light chain multiple myeloma are the black dots that are all in the bottom right quadrant. The patients that had lambda light chain multiple myeloma are the blue triangles that are in the upper right. We also did detected many cases of AL amyloid with this technique, although not all of them. And patients with uh, renal disease do tend to have higher numbers because the light chains don't readily pass into the urine. This was an important discovery, but it, took, but it wasn't until the next year when Dr. Uh, Katzman at the Mayo Clinic uh, did a study to uh, create a reference interval and a diagnostic range. It's important to explain this because this has a Key, is a key feature for detection of the monoclonal gammopathies with our guideline. So first, he used uh, 282 normal individuals uh, who did not have monoclonal gammopathies to create a reference, a 95% reference interval. We typically do that in clinical laboratories, and here is shown the, um, the range for kappa, lambda, and the free light chain ratio at the two standard deviations. Now, Dr. Katzman's test was done on a BAID 
excuse me, dade pairing BN2 instrument. And it's important that you know what instrument it's performed on because that's where these guidelines came from. Now the two, uh, the 95% reference interval is readily understandable. That's plus or minus two standard deviations and we use it in the laboratory often. But he created something unique, a diagnostic range. Over there it says 0.26 to 1.65. How did he get that? Why is that important? Well, let's take a look at Dr. Katzman's data. Here it is. This is all. This is his study. On the left, you have the diagnostic interval. On the on the uh, x-axis, we have the age of the patients. Some of the circles are clear, and others are uh, uh, filled in. And that's just from two different groups of individuals. The ones that were filled in were from frozen samples, which were determined to be uh, uh, not uh, harmed. Uh, they're still useful in this case. So let's take a look at what two standard deviations would be. There it is. And you see, we do have about 2.5% uh, high, 2.5% low as expected. Dr. Katzman didn't think that it was a good idea to call people positive uh, when they are normal individuals. They, they do not have uh, evidence for a monoclonal gammopathy because monoclonal gammopathy is a pre-neoplastic condition. MGUS is not neoplastic, but it's considered pre-neoplastic. Uh, and uh, so he decided to exclude all these. How did he do that? He picked the highest one, he picked the lowest one, and created this range. That's where these numbers come from, and it's important that you know that. It's hard to reproduce that because you don't have these same people all the time at this same time. And laboratory reagents, especially polyclonal antibodies, can change with time, so it must be regulated quite carefully. There are many reports in the literature. There are several publications that report measurements of free light chains vary with uh, the, the instrument that is being used to, to, for their detection. Um, so I took, when, when looking at the literature, this is the initial Katzman study on the top showing the 0.26 to 1.65 diagnostic range, which is what most labs use today. But they, the, um, the uh, manufacturer uh, also notes quite clearly that each laboratory should verify the transferability of the expected values to their own population and, if necessary, determine their own reference interval. The method that's being used makes a difference. So here we have Katzman's on the top. Let's go look at the uh, cotton uh, study. You see there are five entries for cotton in 2018. They had a large number, a large amount of, of sample from many uh, normal individuals, and they sent them to three different places, Dartmouth, uh, Hitchcock Laboratories, the Ohio State University, and the University of North Carolina. And what you see here is very different diagnostic ratios found for all of these. When you look at the image, uh, which is the top one, uh, it, it uh, was fairly similar to the diagnostic range uh, that Katzman came up with 20 years before, uh, it's slightly lower, but the upper end of it was much tighter at 1.26. Same exact samples using the same method, but on a different instrument, the COBUS, showed that the bottom number is quite higher, virtually twice as high as the original, meaning that it would pick up some, uh, if, you, if you were using the uh, original Katzman numbers, you might, uh, you, uh, it wouldn't pick up some of the uh, cases of lambda that were between 0.26 and 0.50. And the top was also much higher, 2.43 versus 1.65, indicating that there would be fewer false positives with this method. Then you get to the SPA plus uh, system, uh, and that uh, showed a kind of in-between number of 0.36 uh, for the lower end and 2.07 for the uh, high end. And then you have the optolytes. This, I think, is very important, and it gives me hope because you can see there's quite a variety of things here. The optolyte was actually the exact same test was being done on the exact same instrument in two different institutions. Ohio State University and the University of North Carolina. And you'll see the, the happy news is it performed exactly the same. Well, there's a slight difference, but it, this, this is virtually the same. So the, it is the instrument that is the difference, not the location, 
not the, the, uh, the assay itself. It is the instrument that makes the difference. And it's important because the optolyte is, as I will show you, a critically important in instrument right now, at least in the United States. This is from the cotton data, so you can see what, what happened. This is the kappa to lambda ratios. It's color-coded. The red square shows the original uh, Katzmann boundaries, and you'll see many of the cases fall out of that with the new testing. And with the image, which is a very tight one, uh, at the other end, many cases would be missed with uh, that range. The most recent data comes from Morales Garcia in, in Madrid, where they once again developed a uh, higher range, even than the, the other opulite. This was done three years later. And so the numbers are different, and it just shows that maybe with, diff with different batches, you also need to make changes. Although, again, it's in a different uh, country. Maybe the, there's more a different vari variation in terms of the, the kappa lambda ratios in those individuals. But here is from their study. I'm graphing it the same as this is from their work, just like Katzman's. Here's what they had for a two standard deviation range. Again, some high, some low. This is Katzman. They picked a high one, a low one, and that's where they came out with their ratio. Here, how common is this technique? This shows us the um, current uh, from the 2021 um, CAP survey uh, uh, on this uh, on the on the free light chain assay showing you the binding site reagents, Siemens reagents, and diazime reagents that are used that were used in that uh, study. And this shows which laboratories were using the image, the Optilite, the SPA, Cobus and the Siemens nephilometer. Overwhelmingly, laboratories are using the binding site technique, uh, and um, the, the largest number use the uh, Optilite. So once again, it is important for laboratories to make their checks to see what that diagnostic interval. The, the, the test itself works fine, as you saw in the Ohio State and uh, UNC data. They were virtually identical. Some people do still prefer using the urine test, urine immunofixation. It's not a bad test. It's a, there's good things about it. But the problem is you need a different specimen. You need different reagents. And uh, clinicians just don't tend to send it even when you request it. Um, this shows a um, urine protein electrophoresis that has an overflow pattern. And the nice thing about the urine is you can do an immunofixation on that. And then you can uh, take a 24-hour sample and actually measure the M protein. So it's a very uh, useful test, very sensitive. And when you have a positive free light chain uh, reaction, you do need to do immunofixation on the serum and the urine to confirm it. Here's a study from McTaggart showing one of the reasons that we didn't uh, use uh, urine immunofixation as the initial screening as the recommendation. They were looking at patients suspected of having plasma cell dyscrasia. And out of these almost 3,000 patients, 124, 4.4% did have plasma disorders. 17% were malignant. That was a little, a less than 1% of the study population. And they had paired urine samples in only one out of five, 20%. And the problem with that, is, as shown in the circles, is that they missed one case of a treatable disease, light chain deposition disease, and they missed six cases of MGUS. But unfortunately, these are MGUS patients who did have abnormal free light chains and were at higher risk for progression. Serum, abnormal serum free light chains can mean a lot of things. You can see it in chronic kidney disease just because they have more trouble getting through the glomeruli, uh, more ease getting through the glomeruli. Uh, chronic inflammation uh, is another thing that in some cases will increase uh, the serum free light chain. However, in many of the studies, including Dr. Bradwell's original one, the um, the uh, chronic inflammation doesn't that often cause an increase in the ratio. Part of that could have something to do with different instruments uh, used in laboratories. Um, there is normal population variation always, and of course there can be lots and lots of variations in reagents. Statement two for us is that laboratorians should confirm serum protein electrophoresis abnormality that's suspicious for the presence of an M protein by doing another test. Usually that's immunofixation, or alternate method is okay. There are two other ones that are very good, immunosubtractions and a new kid on the block, mass fix, and we're gonna go over these. 
the strength, the strength of this guideline is moderate, and most people agreed with this. So what are these suspicious bands? Where are they? People tend to just look in the gamma region or maybe the beta gamma region, but you can find monoclonal uh, immunoglobulins uh, anywhere from the alpha right through the gamma region. They are often obscured by things, other things that live there, such as haptoglobin, alpha-2 macroglobulin, transferrin in the beta-1 region, C3, and C3 breakdown products can be suspicious. In the beta gamma region, there's fibrinogen. I know you're not supposed to have fibrinogen in, in, uh, in, uh, plasma, in uh, serum specimens, but some people are on anticoagulants. Sometimes samples get drawn in the wrong tube. So you have to do a, a procedure to, de to detect these. Other things that can cause problems on capillary electrophoresis are contrast, radio contrast dyes and some drugs that will give you uh, spikes. For all these things, you need to follow up with immunosubtraction, immunofixation, or mass fix. So immunofixation is a uh, process that's familiar probably to most of you, and uh, that you just reperform the electrophoresis and where you see a band, uh, you check it by, looking at, by reacting the, the serum with GAM, kappa, and lambda antibodies, and is shown here in, in number four of this figure. Uh, it is this, this particular case is an IgM kappa monoclonal protein. Sometimes they can be trickier though. In this, in case number eight here, you see a strong G lambda, but there's also a weak band in the kappa region. Is that a G kappa that uh, is, is hiding underneath the uh, G peak? Or could it be free kappa? Or could it be a D kappa? What about the rare E kappa? So you do need to do some more work. Here's a case that shows a small cathodal band, very tiny. I'm not sure that everybody would agree it's a band, but it, it's there. And I want to show you how uh, effective immunosubtraction is uh, uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a relatively new technique. It's been around for about 20 years, but only in about the last 10 are people really using it uh, effectively. So here's that case, and I want to show you how to look at immunosubtractions. You can see the band there in the EL. P lane, but after you see it there, I think what I see a band there. I like to uh, look down at at the um, at the uh, um, bottom two lanes, the kappa and the lambda, to see which one subtracted. So in immunosubtraction, you are removing uh, things. So it's labeled IgG. You, you remove the G, A. You remove the A, M. You remove the M, and kappa and lambda likewise. If you look at the bottom with the kappa, there is still a little round lump left after you have done the subtraction, whereas that lump is not present in the lambda. Let's take a look at it here because this shows us that it is a, because the lambda removes it, that would be called an IgG lambda monoclonal gammopathy. It's very small, but it's there. Uh, immunosubtraction is just as sensitive as immunofixation. Ah, the little the blue arrow shows you that there is uh, the, you, the restriction is actually more prominent when you remove the non-involved isotype. So you've removed the kappa in this case, which made the little restriction look even more obvious. Getting rid of background is always a good thing to do. And why care about such small bands, you ask? Because they need to be followed. They may increase very quickly. Mass fix is the new kid on the block. Dr. Murray at Mayo Clinic let me come up there and spend some time with him about a year ago and um, uh, look at his procedure of mass fix, which is now their routine instead of immunofixation. Just as with immunosubtraction, you have to pre-treat the serum uh, to, to, um, to use this technique. With the immunosubtraction, it just subtracted out the particular band. It's the, it works the other way with immunofixation. They purify the IgG, A, M, kappa, and lambda fractions from serum using beads coated with specific antibodies. Then they reduce those fractions. They break the disulfide bonds, and that creates light and heavy chain versions of all these molecules. That's done because smaller molecules are more easy to use in the um, mass spectrometer. They, in their laboratory, they're using a Maldi-Toth method. 
MOLDI stands for Matrix Assisted Laser Desorption Ionization. So they blast a they blast these uh, molecules with a laser beam uh, in a matrix, and that ionizes them and it launches them into the mass spectrometer. And the instrument they were using was the same one we used at, Mich at Michigan for studying microbiology specimens, and I bet many of you have these in your laboratory. They then get five patterns, just like we get five patterns with immunosubtraction, GAM, kappa, lambda, and we get five immunosubtraction patterns uh, with, the in, uh, with the immunosubtraction. Dr. Murray prefers to overlay the patterns um, uh, in, in, in this pattern. So here we're only seeing three things. You're looking at the light chains that were attached to IgG here, or the light chains attached to IgA in the IgA band, or the light chains that are attached to the IgM in the IgM band. So the dark line here in the IgG are the light chains that were associated with normal IgG, two small, uh, two very smooth humps. Uh, what you're seeing here, this is the, the on the x-axis is the um, mass to charge ratio. You see the number 11 and 12 below, that stands for 11, uh, and uh, 12,000. It says LC plus 2. That means that those light chains had a charge of plus 2. So the mass charge ratio is uh, half of what it would be. The 11 then would indicate uh, a molecular weight of 22,000. The 12 would be 24,000. So you're looking at precise molecular weights of these molecules. For IgA, Here's the band. The black band shows you what the IgA is. It's nice, smooth band showing two humps. IgM, the same thing. The black band there shows you there uh, three little humps. They're small, but very smooth. The blue, nice blue uh, peak, is normal free lambda. So in immunofixation, you have your lambda band. That would be the lambda. And uh, the, for the orange band, that is the kappa. And they have the same kappa band and the same lambda band in all three. So you can compare each heavy, uh, the heavy chains, uh, the light chains from the heavy chains to the uh, light chain types. How does that work in a real case? Here's a monoclonal gammopathy. If you look at the black bands here, uh, this is for the G, the M, and the A rather, and the M. So on the bottom, let's look at the M band. It's very, there's, there's not much of it. That's because this is a myeloma patient with immunoparesis. It's, it's suppressed. The IgA band is also very low. It's suppressed. But in the IgG, there is a good deal of it. And if we blow that image up a little bit, you can see that there is a, a definite spike. It is the patient's IgG kappa. And uh, um, Smaller band labeled ELO, that's elotuzumab. You can identify elotuzumab and daratumumab also if, you, if, if it has, if it was present. And there's all, always a, a matrix effect because the, the monoclonal protein is embedded in a matrix when the laser hits it until you get a second peak that relates to that. So this is a pretty nice example of how you could diagnose an IgG kappa monoclonal protein. It is not only more precise than immunofixation, it is much more sensitive. As shown here, this is an IgM kappa uh, monoclonal protein that you can see on the uh, top immunofixation that's labeled four. Uh, and it's pretty easy to see on that fix. To its left is the uh, mass, mass fix pattern, uh, clearly showing a band. Uh, when you dilute it one to 100, the band almost disappears from the uh, immunofixation easily is there with the uh, mass fix. And it's totally gone by the one to 200 uh, dilution. And it's still uh, obvious in the mass fix. Statement three, laboratorians or clinical care providers should provide, should follow up on serum free light and abnormal serum free light chain uh, ratio for the presence of a monoclonal immunoglobulin protein by doing a serum immunofixation or alternative method with similar sensitivity, I sub or mass fix. The strength of this guideline is low, but it is important. Let's take a look. 
the serum free light chain uh, will be able to find mixed uh, missed monoclonal proteins, as shown by Dr. Angela Dispensieri, also from the Mayo Clinic, in this Lancet article. And what she did was she performed serum free light chain testing on over 18,000 uh, individuals had, who had previously been studied by Dr. Kyle in, a, in another work. And uh, that study just used serum protein electrophoresis and would reflex the immunofixation if they found something. In this study, on those same samples, Dr. Dispensieri found 610 cases that were positive for an abnormal free light chain, which is 3.3% of those cases. 213 of those individuals already had immunoglobulin heavy chain expression, MGUS. But using immunofixation on all 610, they found 57 cases that had intact M proteins that had been missed. That is, they were hidden in the serum protein electrophoresis pattern, but not obvious. Here's a case for you to look at for a second. What do you think this is? I, I've said that it looks like an acute phase pattern to me. The albumin is low. It says L there by the albumin level. It says the alpha-1 is high and alpha-2 is high. The C3 band, which is the first band in the beta region, looks a little low compared to the uh, I'm sorry, the transferrin band is a little low, the beta-1 band, compared to the C3 band, which is the beta-2 band. But it's not just acute phase. There's something else going on here. It has an abnormal free light chain ratio, and um, that caused us to do an immunofixation on it. And the immunofixation shows us a band in the IgA and in the kappa. It's an IgA kappa monoclonal protein that would have been missed had we not done our serum free light chain tests. As Dr. Dispensieri recommends. So this is an important article by Thorne and colleagues that, that uh, corrected a um, misstatement that I make in my uh, uh, 2012 book. I said that you can't see something that you, you can't uh, you, uh, you can't subtract something that you can't see. But in fact, you can see subtle things. So immunosubtraction is really equivalent to immunofixation. And Dr. Thorne's very careful article, recent article, does a great job of showing this. And she shows something even more important, that we need training in the new techniques. That's not a big surprise, but she's the first to really show this well. What she did was she had a group of in, in, in individuals who were reviewers who had seen in, immunosubtraction, and they, uh, they were tested on a bunch of samples. And then they trained these individuals, and then they saw different samples, not the same ones, and their sensitivity improved by 19%. So a lot of the earlier papers that said that immunosubtraction uh, wasn't as sensitive as immunofixation probably is looking at an issue of appropriate training. In, in her study, she had a large number of patients. When an M spike was present uh, in the uh, patient's serum, uh, by protein electrophoresis, the immunofixation and immunosubtraction both found 615 cases. There was one case that was present with immunofixation and that immunosubtraction missed. But actually, immunosubtraction did better because they found 12 cases that immunofixation had missed. When there was no monoclonal immunoglobulin protein spike seen on the routine protein electrophoresis, things get very dicey. Only 157 of these 496 cases were positive for both immunofix and immunosubtraction. The uh, immunofix was able to pick up 167 that immunosubtraction didn't, and immunosubtraction picked up a little more, 172 that immunofixation didn't. Clearly, these are interesting techniques. They each have their advantages and disadvantages. We use both in our laboratory at the University of Michigan. I thank Dr. Thorne for the, her efforts in, in promoting this technique and showing some great examples. You should read this paper. So here's something for you to in, interpret. It's a uh, more subtle case. So let's see how your skills are in this. Um, so in this particular instance, we have, uh, if you compare the kappa and the lambda areas, there's something subtracting on the anodal side of kappa that is not subtracting in the lambda uh, and anodal side, which heavy chain also does this. And if we look around at it, 
it's the IgA. So this is an IgA kappa. I know this looks subtle, but it's kind of like a lot of other things that we do in pathology, recognizing the first time you see subtle things, you say, oh, nobody can see this. But, but after you've seen two, three, four of these, it just jumps right out at you. Statement four. Critical care providers should order all of them. Serum protein electrophoresis, serum free light chain, serum immunofixation, and urine immunofixation when the patients are suspected of having AL amyloid, systemic amyloid symptoms. The evidence for this is uh, moderate, and most uh, uh, respondents agreed that this was the right thing to do. This is the original uh, Katzman study I showed you earlier. They had a huge number of cases at Mayo. Uh, it's a referral center, of course, uh, for AL amyloid. And you'll notice here that they have, uh, by, we detect by the serum, fix, serum protein electrophoresis and uh, free light chain, 96.2% of the cases, a little better than if we just did the uh, immunofixation and the uh, urine immunofixation. But you can get a few more, uh, two, two or three more percent when you, do, when you add uh, the urine immunofixation and serum immunofixation. And we think this should be done. And this is a study from Palladini showing you at least one example of why. He has all kinds of examples in this paper, which you, I encourage you to look at. But this one, I picked this one out because it's six patients who had a biclonal gammopathy. So we had over on the right, it, it, we, I'm circling that two of these free, free light chain kappa lambda ratios were absolutely normal. If you look in the middle column, the urine immunofixation, those two samples were positive by the urine immunofixation. So doing all of these makes sense in those, uh, for those uncommon cases of uh, AL amyloid suspicion. So what's going on here? Here is a serum that looks pretty normal to me. Normal to you as well. I don't see anything abnormal about it. The GANM look normal. Oh, there it is. The free light chain for lambda is high and the ratio is low. So let's see. if it's a free lambda, I would think, well, maybe it would be in the urine but it's not in the urine of this patient. There's not a whole lot in the urine of this patient. So we're not, we're not having any help finding it. This is a patient that has AL amyloid. And the lambda is how we detected and followed this patient, biopsy proven. So what this shows you is the, 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 the free lambda levels in green and the free kappa levels in blue and their ratio in violet over a period of seven years, going from 2013 to 2020. And the case, uh, the sample I just showed you was somewhere in the middle here, 2018. And it shows how we were using the lambda light chain to follow this patient's treatment. Statement five, clinical care providers should not order the heavy light chain isotype assay for the initial detection of M proteins in patients with suspected monoclonals. It's a fine assay, but it is not meant for this. The strength of it to support this is low. The, um, this, the example I'm showing is from Dr. Katzman's study uh, where he used a three range uh, to um, uh, not, inc not include normal individuals in, 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 in this, similar to what he did with the serum free light chain test. And he found that looking uh, at um, diagnostic serum samples, uh, there were 32 patients that had a monoclonal IgG M protein, 31 were detected by the protein electrophoresis alone, 30 were detected by the abnormal heavy light chain ratio. That ratio did a bit, a bit better in the post-treatment sample follow-ups, uh, but pretty similar. Overall, it didn't um, make a difference, and so we think while this is useful for many things, it, is not, uh, it was not recommended for the initial detection. Statement six. Um, clinical care providers should not use the total intact light chain test for quantification of M proteins in patients suspected of having multiple myeloma. So there's two light chain tests available. There's a, one that measures uh, light chains that are attached to immunoglobulins, that they're part of an intact immunoglobulin molecule as well as the free light chain, and ones that measure only the free light chain. People confuse these. And that's why we think you should not be using this test really at all. Um, this shows the difference in the, these two. If you look at the, uh, the different light chains here, the mean ratio for the uh, free light chain test is about 1, 0 
whereas total light change is two, uh, is about, it's, it's quite different, it's two. The other thing I'm showing you here is that they're different in three orders of magnitude. Of course, there are a lot more intact immunoglobulin molecules in the serum because they're too big to get out of the urine quickly. That's why the light chains uh, do not uh, stay in the serum. Uh, we did used to use this. This is an article that I published 34 years ago that I'm telling you not to do anymore. Uh, Jeff Warren, John Lyle, and I put together this where we could diagnose monoclonal gammopathies using high-resolution electrophoresis and the total light chain test. Don't do it anymore. <laughs> Please. It's my own article. I'm, I'm, I'm nixing it. Okay, statement seven. In patients with intact monoclonal proteins that are outside of the gamma region by serum protein electrophoresis, it's often uh, difficult to measure them. Uh, A's and M's uh, happen more often, but sometimes they're G's. And we, uh, we're recommending uh, quantitation using, using the total immunoglobulin of that isotype measured by nephilometry, A, G, or M. Um, we're still saying that if, if, you can, if, you, if you can distinguish the M protein from the background by, with something like immunosubtraction, you may try to, you may, you may be able to, to measure that. But we, we, the problem with that we, is that it doesn't give much harmonization between different laboratories. I will show you an example. The strength of F evidence for this is very low. This is from a study, uh, a report from the International Myeloma Working Group in 2014, where they did recommend that uh, for uh, a beta migrating monoclonal protein, initially you could just measure the total IgA. Um, they didn't measure GNM because the M protein concentration with GNMs uh, often is overestimated by nephilometry. Nonetheless, it could give you harmony. I will show you an example. Here's a patient with a spike in the beta region and a little spike uh, in, the, in the anodal end of the gamma region. Uh, G is 495, A is 1900, M is 26. If you do immunosubtraction, and now you've seen a few cases, you can see uh, with the IgA, uh, uh, the, it subtracts out, and the little bit subtracts out in the uh, gamma region as well. So it's an IgA um, kappa, not gamma, IgA kappa, monoclonal protein. You could do a immuno, um, a, a perpendicular trop on this to get a measurement. And in this case, I got one uh, measurement of 1.84 for the bigger peak and 0 0.08 for the smaller one. Adding them up, I got 1.92. So it looks not unreasonable. If you look back to the other one, it pretty much covers the area that had been cleared. It was that's not an unreasonable thing to do. But we're telling you probably the better thing to do is just do the total IgA, which gave you virtually the same answer. 1,900 milligrams per deciliter is the same as 1.92 grams per deciliter. And the advantage of this is that these are the measurements I made. That doesn't make them perfect by any means. And uh, if somebody else in my lab might measure it slightly differently. In a different lab, they might get totally different numbers. But the IgA, the nephilometry number, everybody would get the same. It harmonizes what we do. Statement eight, laboratories should report both quantitative levels of free light and free lambda, as well as the, uh, uh, the ratio of the free light chain. And this, uh, the evidence for this is very low because it's also fairly straightforward. So there's not a lot of other studies on this. Um, it is basically what we're showing you from Bradwell's classic study to the more recent studies. It is the ratio that is important. So just reporting the free light chains uh, without the ratio is not appropriate. Statement nine shows that providers can use several features to, to, uh, to help uh, distinguish uh, progression, those, those patients who are at high risk for progression to multiple myeloma or B-cell lymphoproliferative disorders. So they can use the ratio that we've been talking about of the free light chain. They can use the isotype. Now, IgM isotype is the one that is at the most increased risk for progression. They can use the um, measurement of the M protein. If it's 1.5 grams per deciliter or greater, they are at a higher risk of progressing. They can use the um, immunoparesis, decrease in non-involved isotypes below reference intervals. And I will show you the examples here. The strength for this evidence is low. 
Here we see a, a study from Dr. Kyle in 2018, where he shows that the IgG is the least to progress, as shown in the bars on the right. Um, the M protein level, if you're less than 1.5 grams per deciliter, your chances of progressing are about half that of the, of the uh, individuals that have a uh, higher uh, amount of um, immunoglobulin monoclonal protein. And the free light chain ratio, once again, is a very important uh, feature to, to uh, look at to see if uh, they're progressing. It's even a bit stronger than the M protein level. This is looking at immunoparesis, the, uh, uh, the immunosuppressions that the patients have. This is a recent study from Gang on 287 newly diagnosed multiple myeloma patients, and they're comparing progression on people that have uh, deep or partial immunoparesis at the red band versus the control. And you can see if you look at the 50% probability of progression, there is uh, uh, almost a, a two-year two difference. Good practice issue is that is the use of measurement in um, monoclonal gammopathies. As we've been showing you, it's a very important in looking at risk of progression for ones that are greater than 1.5 grams per deciliter. It's important to have the initial measurement so that you can follow patients with MGUS. How can you tell if it's going up or down if you don't know what the original M protein is? It's important for establishing the diagnosis of smoldering multiple myeloma, which is a, much, is a higher level of risk uh, than uh, MGUS, and that requires a uh, it, even if their bone marrow plasma cells are normal, if they have greater than three grams per deciliter, they are considered uh, a smoldering multiple myeloma. And once again, it's important to follow smoldering multiple myeloma with that. And for treating multiple myeloma patients, to see what their response is to therapy, you need to know what the original M protein was before the treatment. But there are two ways to measure. The monoclonal proteins, you can do with perpendicular drops, as I'm showing you on the left, or tangent skimming, showing you on the right. So we're using the exact same demarcation points. I have the arrows at the exact same point. I didn't change them when I switched from the one to the other. And you can see it's measured as 1.47 with the perpendicular drop and 0.95 on the right. The problem with the perpendicular drop is that it includes a lot of polyclonal immunoglobulins beneath it. So its accuracy depends on what the ratio is of the M spike to the polyclonal material beneath it. The problem with tangent skimming is that it doesn't uh, benefit from uh, having the sample go all the way down to the bottom, and you do miss a bit of the actual M protein. There's a study by Christoph Schild of the two methods, perpendicular drop and tangent skimming, published in 2008. Schild um, was using capillary electrophoresis at the time. He used uh, two different M proteins, monoclonal proteins, one 50 grams per liter of the G and 25 grams per liter of an A, and he did serial dilutions on these. Then he looked at their recovery. Ideal would be uh, a straight line going across from 100. Uh, the um, x-axis shows the M protein concentration after the dilution, 10, 20, 30, 40, and 50 grams per deciliter and the recovery is on the y-axis. And he shows us that with perpendicular drop, the A and the G were linear down to fifth, around 15 grams per liter. But using tangent skimming, he could detect it uh, one log lower. And I prefer tangent skimming for gamma region M proteins, but it gets dicey when you get into the beta gamma and beta region. It's hard because there are other proteins there that uh, interfere with it, which is why the um, guidelines say that for those proteins, one should consider using the total A, G, or M. The um, perpendicular drop using the same demarcations, though, when the M spike is big, such as in patients that are more likely to have monoclonal uh, multiple myeloma, uh, there's usually not very much difference between the two. Harmonization problem with current measurements? Well, each method works well within a laboratory. So if you're using the um, same laboratory all the time, you're going to get uh, good results uh, from one, one to the other. However, between different methods, uh, it, it does not compare well. You cannot compare well use uh, a laboratory using tangent skimming to one that's using perpendicular drop. 
Um, following patients with the same methods in the same laboratory is the best thing to do. It sounds impractical right now. One of the hopes for the future that I have is from observing mass spectrometry, uh, it improves precision of detecting the monoclonal spike and uh, it uh, should harmonize things between laboratories because now instead of just talking about a band that's in the fast gamma region or the slow beta region, you have a precise molecular weight and you can uh, do uh, quantifications uh, with this technique as well. So our, in summary, this is what we're doing. If you have a patient that has a clinical suspicion of a monoclonal gammopathy, you're going to perform serum protein electrophoresis and serum free light chain. And there's an asterisk by the light chain because if the patient has symptoms of a neuropathy, then you need to add serum immunofixation. If they're being worked, out, worked up for AL amyloid, you need to add both serum and urine immunofixation. If those turn out to be, uh, if either the protein electrophoresis or the uh, uh, serum free light chain are suspicious, you need to perform immunofixation, immunosubtraction, or mass fix. You also need to measure the uh, gamma M spike, and you also need to perform G, A, and M measurements uh, for non-gamma M spikes, and also to detect individuals uh, who have immunoparesis. So if you have, um, again, if you uh, receive Archives of Pathology, you've already seen the article. This is the article in detail. It will do a much better job, I'm sure, than I have done today to show these to you. And uh, you can uh, feel free to contact me if you do have questions about this. Finally, I'd like to remind you that a happy Benz Jones is a non-hyphenated Benz Jones. So thank you very much for your attention, and I'll be glad to answer your questions. Thank you, Dr. Karen, for your informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen, and we'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. All right, let's get started. Our first question asks, we performed the tests ordered by our physicians, and probably not all of these orders are in line with these guidelines. Any advice on how to inform the ordering physicians about the guidelines and change their ordering patterns? I think it's very important to work uh, directly and very personally with your clinicians. We, we love to meet with ours, to attend uh, different rounds that the clinicians have, to talk to the chiefs of service uh, and show them the data, they show them the guidelines and the reasons why. The, the idea is to have a not only improve service in one place, but to have a bit of harmonization of how service is done so that everybody reaches the high quality. That, uh, and by choosing tests, only serum protein electrophoresis and the serum free light chain test, we're only doing two tests. So it should be relatively affordable. We were concerned about that too in, in, for different locations. And, um, and the other thing is that in, it, is, it may not be obvious to clinicians that the, the subtle differences in the tests and the things that the tests are good or not quite as good at. Uh, so that is what uh, I would recommend. Just get together with your clinicians, work with them, talk to the chiefs of services, um, and walk down the hall and actually talk to them in person with a mask on, of course, these days. Great, thank you. Our next question asks, are there, or excuse me, are these the first CAP guidelines in monoclonal gammopathies, or are there earlier versions? If there are earlier versions, what are the differences between the two? Yes, there was a version in 1999. Um, it came out, uh, and uh, the differences relate to the fact that the uh, serum free light chain test was not invented until uh, 2001 by Dr. Bradwell. That certainly created a huge difference. In 1999, many of the uh, protein electrophoresis techniques uh, did not provide crisp separation of beta-1 from beta-2 um, bands, mm -hmm. which is important in seeing beta-migrating monoclonal uh, proteins or suspicious bands. And today, um, techniques like capillary electrophoresis by both of the manufacturers are very good. They're the um, gel electrophoresis, uh, most, just about all of them have much better resolution. And we also have better studies. We have much better studies uh, looking at the, the results uh, of these tests. And finally, it's the treatments. As I showed you in the start of the talk, 
the uh, therapies prior to the year 2000 were very poor, and it, it didn't make a huge difference uh, when or how you were diagnosed. But now we have we have treatments that are milder, more focused, and they're getting better and better all the time. So it is really very important to pick this up as soon as you can. Thank you, Dr. Karen. Next question here asks, are CAP guidelines mandatory and enforceable? No, these are guidelines. Um, it, it, um, these, are, these are not, um, these are the suggestions from a group of experts. We took people that represented all the major in, in, in groups that write about this technique. So we had representatives, we, we actually had the person who was the lead author, uh, Dr. Sachi Kumar, uh, from uh, the International Myeloma Working Group was wor worked on our board. We had uh, Dr. David Murray, who uh, has, uh, does the mass fix technique. We had uh, uh, Dr. McCudden. We had uh, all kinds of experts uh, from around the country. We had technologists that actually do the assays. So these are our recommendations from people who have studied this and worked on this for years, for decades. It doesn't mean everything's perfect. It doesn't mean we've got everything right. We certainly are interested in listening to, to questions and, and ideas. Um, but uh, we hope that people will take these into consideration. And maybe someday this will become part of uh, in inspection guidelines. But I think just working for the patients, this is a good, good, a good start. Great, thank you. Our next question here asks, what are the best practices to adopt these guidelines in our lab? Do you have any advice? Are these guidelines followed in your laboratory? Uh, the best practices to follow these guidelines is to just go over them with your 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 group and uh, and see what is practical. If it uh, you you don't need to adopt immunosubtraction if you're not currently doing it. You certainly don't need to adopt doing mass uh, fix if you don't have that ready. The the, the mass fix is not broadly used right now. Uh, it's used, I know, at the Mayo Clinic, Memorial Sloan Kettering, where Dr. Thorin is and Dr. Murata, uh, they do it. Uh, we do not do that at the University of Michigan right now. Uh, we're aware of mass fix, and we do send cases uh, to the Mayo Clinic to do mass fix on some of our samples. So that might be an answer for some institutions who uh, don't have these available. You can always refer problem cases to them. That's not going to be, it's not a lot of our cases right now. People ask me, well, is something like mass fix, um, is it uh, cost effective? Um, Dr. Murray tells me it is faster and costs less to do the mass fix than what it used to cost them to do um, Im Im immunofixation at, at his laboratory. Uh, so we do some of them at the University of Michigan, but we don't do all of them at the University of Michigan. But I think it's, it's like a lot of things. It was designed to be cost effective as well as focused on the best practices available for patients. So look at it, work with your, your technologists, work with your clinicians to see what works best for you and gradually adopt them. Wonderful, thank you. And it looks like we have time for one more question here. So we'll wrap up with this one and this asks, so these guidelines are about the diagnosis of monoclonal gammopathies. Are they applicable to follow up or monitoring of the patient? Sure, it's uh, it's for the um, it's it's for patients who are where you're testing patients who have a suspicion of a monoclonal gammopathy, and that will vary. So if you have a a, a, a neurology patient that has uh, peripheral neuropathies, uh, paresthesias, and no other explanation, one explanation might be that monoclonal gammopathy, and so that's why when you order the M protein study on that patient. You want to order the immunofixation because I, I showed you it's going to be a little more sensitive than just doing the protein electrophoresis and the, and the serum free light chain test alone. But once you have that diagnosis, it's very helpful in following them. It's essential. How do you know if the MGUS patient is, is, uh, is uh, progressing uh, with their condition? Uh, some MGUSs can be stable for decades, just going nowhere. But we know that as a group, they progress 1% a year to multiple myeloma or another B-cell lymphoproliferative disorder. So you do want to catch those things as early as you can, especially with our newer drugs today. 
So uh, yes, it is, it's definitely more than just the initial detection. The initial detection, you want to characterize it so you know what you're looking for in the future, and you want to measure it so that you can follow the progression of the disease. Wonderful. Well, thank you again, Dr. Karen, for your time today and your important research. We'd also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Binding Site, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Questions we do not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. This webcast can be viewed on demand and LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, take care everyone. Goodbye.